Hello and welcome back to the Quantum Information Reading Seminar, where our, tri where our goal is to read through the paper Black Holes as Mirrors by Hayden and Preskill. In the previous video, we were looking at the setup, the quantum setup of the, the, the main quantum setup of the paper and the main focus of the paper Black Holes as Mirrors. And we got so far as to identify the first few steps in a protocol whereby Alice, in possession of k qubits, tries to throw them into a local black hole in order to destroy the information present in the k qubits. We discussed three, three particular time steps in this protocol, namely and the, the state of the uh, black hole and the rest of the universe during and at these three time steps. The three time steps we identified were t init, just before everything takes place, T Alice, when Alice throws in her information in the black hole, and T Alice plus Epsilon, when the black hole dynamics acts on the degrees of freedom present inside the black hole. Today we will continue reading the paper and study now the dynamics of the full dynamics and the full description of the protocol whereby Alice tries to destroy quantum information by throwing it into a black hole. And I will continue reading right where we left off last time. Right after Alice tosses in her qubits, the n qubit black hole system B is maximally entangled with the system NE. Now, if you recall, the black hole has been radiating for some time and is entangled with the outgoing radiation. The outgoing radiation we'll call E. So the, the, the systems involved so far in the description of this pro protocol is B, the black hole, E, the radiation, and now we're about to discuss further subsystems. Here B includes Alice's memory system M, which has now been absorbed by the black hole. All right, this is just, this is at T Alice plus Epsilon. B, the black hole includes Alice's memory subsystem that Alice threw in to the black hole. E is the previously emitted Hawking radiation, now controlled by Bob, and N is Charlie's reference systems that had been entangled with M. Recall that we employed the device whereby Alice did not throw in just qubits, but in fact halves of entangled pairs where, where, where the other half of the entangled pair are held by some reference or some fictitious uh, third party called Charlie. And this is a useful device for analyzing uh, all possible input states that Alice might throw into the black hole. So let's draw a little, again, draw a little space time type diagram to indicate how this is all working. So here's time going upwards. Here's the black hole. The black hole, of course, in this picture is more like a, uh, a region. This is the black hole B, and it's radiating as time passes. Radiation flies off and is described by the subsystem E. Here comes Alice, and here comes Charlie. Charlie is a fictitious third party. Alice through has prepared a maximally, in state, maximally entangled state with Charlie and throws one half into the black hole. And this is M and Charlie's system is called N. Uh, N is Charlie's reference system, that's right, yes. So we'll put that up here. So M, Alice's qubits, N is Charlie's qubits. So right after this time step here, this instant in time here, when Alice throws the qubits in the black hole, then the black hole system is just, it, it now includes M, right? So B, B is continually changing and that's one of the, the important features of this whole story is that the black hole degrees of freedom are changing the time. The number of degrees of freedom that the black hole uh, is comprised of is changing with time. 
And so right after the instant where Alice, Alice's qubits enter the black hole, the black hole system gets updated to include those additional qubits. But of course, the whole time we've had these other subsystems. So E, the environment, the radiation subsystem has been around the whole time. And we also have Charlie's qubits there around the whole time. And so at this moment, just where Alice's qubits enter the black hole, we have a, a, a rearrangement of which subsystems are being described as the black hole and which are the rest of the universe. So just before, uh, the, the bracketing looks something like this, right? I'm using brackets here to describe which systems are considered independent subsystems. We have the environment, which is the radiation, which is flown off at the speed of light. We have the black hole, which is a second subsystem, and we have the Charlie and Alice subsystem. So there's essentially four subsystems before the moment Alice's qubits enter the black hole. Immediately after Alice's qubits enter the black hole, we have three subsystems, right? Because Alice's qubits have now vanished into the black hole and are now considered to be the black hole itself. So uh, the, the subsystem decomposition is now EBN, environment, ball, uh, black hole, and remaining qubits in Charlie's possession. So, yeah, 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 we've read all this. Charlie's reference system that had been entangled with them. As Bob watches attentively, the black hole continues to emit Hawking radiation until, after a while, S additional qubits, the subsystem R of B, have been emitted, with N minus S qubits, the subsystem B prime, still retained by the black hole. We suppose for now that the emitted S qubit system R of B is chosen uniformly at random. We will revisit this assumption in section 5. That is, we imagine that B is divided into two parts, one with with s qubits and the other with n minus s qubits, then a unitary transformation vb chosen uniformly at random with respect to the ha measure on u2 to the n is applied to b. After that, the s qubit system is identified as r. So there's a lot going on there. So this is what we might call t alice plus um, some additional radiation time. So the qubit, you know, we will try and try and draw a space-time diagram which captures all the stuff that's going on here. So here's the radiating black hole here getting sort of smaller because the radiation degrees of freedom are coming off. And then here comes Alice's qubits M to join in with the degrees of freedom of the black hole. It falls into the black hole here. The black hole gets a bit bigger and then it continues to radiate again, right? And then when S qubits have come out, that's the next stage of the protocol where we're going to uh, analyze. So this is the black hole. Sort of. so the black hole radiates, gets smaller. Alice's qubits fall in. The black hole gets a bit bigger and continues to radiate S more qubits. So let's write down the numbers of qubits that happen at these various times. So, so we have a sense of what's going on here. So just before Alice's qubits fall into the black hole, the black hole is comprised of n minus k qubits. Just afterwards, it's n qubits. And up here, it's n minus s qubits. So if I draw another picture and draw plot, if you like, the number of qubits in the black hole over time is T Alice. So the number of qubits in the black hole sort of dropping here, it's around N minus K, and then it jumps to N. Which drops to at this point here. to n minus s qubits. Of course, the black hole continues to radiate until it is comprised of zero qubits. So what happens at the moment where the black hole has emitted n minus, uh, has emitted s qubits is that, well, during the, the time that the black hole emits the, n, the s qubits, 
we imagine that the qubits that come out of the black hole are somehow chosen at random, right? We don't have any reason to choose one internal degree of freedom of the black hole over another. I mean, all things being equal and the black hole being presumably a symmetric object, we should just choose one of the constituent qubits at random to radiate by the black hole. And that's the content of this, this sentence here. Suppose that the emitted s qubit system is chosen uniformly at random. So in order to, to actually mathematically affect that, so the black hole system itself, let's call it B, right? I mean, I know that the, the, we know that the black hole system is, the, the constituent qubits are changing over time. It's always continually radiating, but let's call the black hole system B um, at T Alice plus T rad. It's a slight, yeah, it's slightly awkward um, to do it this way, but what we'll do is we'll say that the black hole system B is really comprised of two subsystems, yes? It's comprised of the Q subsystem which is to be emitted. I, we know that it's emitted over a period of time, but just for the sake of this illustration here, we're gonna suppose that the S qubits are just emitted at the moment T Alice plus T rad and uh, is also comprised of the remaining qubits. So it's n minus, uh, the black hole system is n minus s qubits, um, tensor s qubits. So this is the radiated stuff. So if the state, the, the state of these internal black hole degrees of freedom uh, is say at T Alice, the state is given by, I don't know, some density operator, right? it's entangled with the outside world. So the state of the black hole at time T Alice is just some mixed state. I mean, it's quantum degrees of freedom that are entangled with exterior degrees of freedom. It has to be in a mixed state. Then after this time that it takes to radiate the S qubits, some internal dynamics take place. And that internal dynamics is described by a unitary matrix VB. How big is the black hole? Well, remember it's N qubits. So, the Hilbert space that we require to describe those n qubits is C2 to tensor n times. So what do, what unitary uh, process acts on C2 tensor n times? Well, something from the unitary group on two to the n by two to the n matrices. That's how the black hole is gonna act in, in the, the period of time between T Ls and T Ls plus T rad. So this, the black hole state undergoes this dynamics. This is now at time T Alice plus T rad, right? And then the, the, the S qubit's gonna exit the black hole. And, uh, and how do they exit the black hole? Well, you if you look at it from the perspective of the internal degrees of the black hole, you trace them out, right? You have no longer access to them. So I'll just type, I'll just write here trace rad, meaning we're gonna trace out the radiation degrees of freedom to give us the, the state of the black hole um, so the operation is trace out rad, right? To give us the degrees of freedom of the, the black hole after the uh, qubits have omitted. And so that'll give us a posterior state that we might call sigma B, which is given by trace uh, of the radiation degrees of freedom of the state of the black hole before the, the qubits were emitted. Um, and that's it, that's, what's, that's what the state of this black hole system is after the qubits have been emitted. From the perspective of the of an observer outside the black hole, we would do things the other way around, but I don't think we're there yet. And yeah, we got a name for these radiation degrees of freedom. They are called R. So I've been calling it rad, but let's just now shorten it to R. So this notation here is potentially very confusing, right? You know, 
I've got sigma b, the state of the black hole, is in a smaller Hilbert space, or acts on a smaller Hilbert space than rho b, right? But remember, a black hole is a dynamical object with a number of degrees of freedom comprising this object change with time. So the state of the black hole is a time-dependent quantity, and hence also a Hilbert space dimension dependent quantity. As the Hawking radiation leaks out, the correlations between the evaporating black hole B prime and the reference system N gradually weaken. Once R is large enough, the surviving correlation of N with B prime becomes negligible. So here's the next part of the, uh, of the setup. All right. And so probably, actually, I skipped over this figure, but I wonder if we can now understand this figure. So let's take a look at this figure, see if it matches what I've been drawing so far. So as time right here at the bottom, time starts, right? Alice becomes maximally entangled with this reference system, Charlie. Remember, Charlie is a fictitious system. You don't have to really think of Charlie as existing, but it's very helpful. And so Alice's qubits become entangled with Charlie's qubits. Then Alice drops her qubits into the black hole. Also, as the black hole evolves, it emits quantum degrees of freedom called E, the radiation. The black hole is assumed maximally entangled with that radiation. That's one of these you know, articles of faith that we take on in going through this story. Then Alice's qubits enter the black hole. Then some time passes and a, some kind of internal dynamics takes place, uh, which describes the internal dynamics of the black hole. And this just affects the degrees of freedom that are in, currently in the black hole. And then, and then afterwards, right, the black hole continues to be there, but it's, it continues to radiate qubits. So it's radiating, radiating, qubits are coming out. And this next part of the paper here is telling us that when R, this, the number of qubits that have been radiated is large enough, the correlation of N with B prime becomes negligible. So N is Charlie's subsystem and B prime is the remaining degrees of freedom of the black hole. So when R becomes large enough, so many qubits are radiated that they've carried out all that entanglement that N, Charlie initially had with the black hole back out into the outgoing radiation. At this point, since the overall state of B prime R N E is pure, the state of the reference system is very ne ne nearly purified by the radiation system, RE, that Bob controls. By this time, Alice's quantum information has fallen into Bob's hands. Okay, if we look at this picture here, we know that after some period of time, Charlie is no longer entangled with the black hole. So the system N and B prime shares no entanglement anymore. And so the only entanglement that's left must be between Charlie's system, N, the outgoing radiation, E, and the, also the other radiation that was radiated after Alice's qubits fell in R. So the state of the system should be, and since the overall state of the system is assumed pure, so right, uh, at this point, since the overall state of the B prime R N E system is pure, the state of the reference system N is very nearly purified by the radiation system R E the Bob controls. That's right, yeah. N R E, right? Here's the entanglement there. So now we wanted to start, you know, attaching names to the states that have uh, describing this setup. So let's give a name to the pure density operator of B and E. Remember, it's crucial that B and E is in a pure state. And why is B and E in a pure state? I asked myself. So B and E is a pure density operator. Psi B and E is a pure density operator. That's a bit confusing because I, as I currently see it, Charlie is entangled with the radiation. B is not entangled with Charlie, but entangled with the radiation. Why should B and E be in a pure state?
So the information we currently have is this. At the point when at R is big enough, the state of the reference system N is very nearly purified by the radiation system RE that Bob controls. So N and R and E are in a pure state. But then I suppose that makes B prime in a pure state too, right? if the overall thing is pure. Also, the B is puzzling, so here they suddenly start talking of B and E, and before there's B prime, am I meant to think of this psi B and E as the state of everything before everything happens? Um, let's test that hypothesis. So psi B and E, maybe that's meant to be what happens before this all happens. So before, let's suppose the current hypothesis is that psi B and E here is the state that's describing things at this period of time. Let's see, there's a color that isn't present on the screen here, yellow. So about here, I'm wondering if psi B and E is describing this, the state of the whole system at this time slice. So here's the subsystem E, here's the subsystem B, and N. Well, that's not in a pure state because N is entangled with M. Okay, then the next hypothesis is, is that psi B and E is describing things just here. Let's test out that hypothesis. Okay, we have E, which is definitely entangled with a black hole. And, okay, well, then that's sort of straightforward because B and E, if that was the case, that, that psi B and E is describing things at this time slice, then naturally it's in a pure state because we've just, um, describe the entire universe, which is an assumed in a pure state for the purposes of this discussion. All right, so I guess what psi B and E is, is the state of the out, already radiated radiation, the black hole internal degrees of freedom, Alice's qubits just after they've entered the black hole and everything else. All right, that, that must, this is the only interpretation that seems to make sense. So let psi B and E denote the pure density operator of B and E and let rho B N be what you get when you trace out E. Um, that's the marginal density operator on Bn. The marginal, excuse me, density operator on Nb prime is given by this thingy here, okay. Now we have to spend a little bit of time to decode these equations. So, so far, everything we've read seems consistent with the hypothesis that psi B and E is basically everything just before the, dynamic, uh, the dynamics act on the internal black hole degrees of freedom and then the qubits are radiated. So now let's try and dig through this notation here. Um, so we've got rho B N as the marginal on Bob and Charlie, uh, 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 the marginal on the black hole and Charlie. Mm. Try and remember this picture. Here's the black hole B, here's the environment, uh, sorry, the, the radiation degrees of freedom, and here's Charlie's degrees of freedom, and it's sort of in here is M, you know, B is comprised of the original black hole degrees of freedom plus uh, Alice's qubits, 
So the black hole itself has got you know, a bunch of degrees of freedom plus Alice's qubits. And then that's B and E, yeah, right? So the state of this whole thing is psi B and E. It's a pure density operator. And then we want to set up some notation, namely sigma B N. Is that right? Yes, rho B N, sorry. Rho B N is just the state of B and N, you know, trace out the radiation. All right, we can do this. So that rho B N just pertains to these two subsystems here. And then we introduce this thingy, sigma N B prime. Okay. So now time passes. So this is at T Alice, what I've been calling T Alice. Now T Alice plus T rad, right? How things are described now. Well, we still have some, you know, degrees of freedom have been reshuffled around. So we've got E, that's the original radiation, plus now we've got some more qubits of radiation. And the way I'm going to draw it is a little bit funny. I'm going to start by drawing B, here's M internal to B, then uh, some kind of VB, a unitary, is applied to the internal degrees of freedom of the black hole, sort of jumbling them all around. And then out comes a chunk of the black hole. And that's the subsystem R. And N has always been there. And so then the black hole, you know, sort of... Then here's the radiation degrees of freedom coming out. And this is B prime. That's what's left over. Okay. So then it's kind of interesting to ask what's the state of... B prime and N. Yeah, that's the state of the degree. So we're going to now ask what's the state of Charlie's degrees of freedom and the remaining black hole degrees of freedom. So sigma prime, uh, sigma B prime and N. Or sigma N B prime, if we want to follow the notation of the paper, is um, what is it? Well, you know, let's do it sort of inside out. I'm not going to do it quite the way the paper does it. So then, no, 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 no. this is after the radiation has been radiated, so VB has to have been applied. So uh, VB acts on B, but not N and not E. So there's going to be some identities here, N, E. And since this is a density operator, we have to act on both sides, right? Oops, that's not a prime, that's a dagger. So that's the state of everything after the internal degrees of freedom have happened. But now we're interested in, we, we don't care about the environment radiation degrees of freedom. Bob has those, we don't care about them. And we also don't care about Ah, the other degrees of radiation degrees of freedom. Bob got his hands on those too. And so now we're left with um, the degrees of freedom just of the remaining black hole and Charlie's degrees of freedom. And that's what sigma NB prime is describing. And uh, that's consistent with what we see here because uh, remember, oops, uh, rho bn is the result of tracing out e of the whole thing and that's what we input in here and rho b rho nb depending on v b is this thing here so okay that's what i've written but just slightly different notation all right now we come to the main equation i presume in the sequel so using standard estimates, we find that the L1 distance of sigma NB prime, so that's the state of the remaining black hole degrees of freedom and Charlie's degrees of freedom, uh, from a product state, averaged over VB, and hence over the choice of subsystem R, can be bounded as blah. Here, blah is the marginal density operator on N, and sigma B prime max is this thing is some marginal density operator on B prime. 
All right. Standard estimates. So I can feel a harm measure integral coming on. Let's have a look at 15 and 16, shall we? Okay, the mother of all protocols, restructuring quantum information's family tree. And 16, a decoupling approach to quantum capacity. All right, I'm gonna be um, bold and see if we can't kind of work this out ourselves. So the objective here is to calculate this integral or this bound. Now, I don't know how to do it. I mean, yeah, of course I spoke to the authors. I, I know these papers, um, but it has been a long time since I've spoken to these authors and I assure you I have very little memory of, of, the, of those discussions. So what we're gonna, the, you know, the, what we're trying to do here, uh, maybe we'll step back and explain that first. What we're trying to do is prove that sigma n b prime is basically a product state. Now we're not going to be able to prove that because it is there is still a bit of residual entanglement. Uh, but what we're going to show is that you know for almost any choice of the black hole's internal dynamics, that most likely sigma n b prime will be very close to a product state on average. That's the actual statement that we're going to take aim at. And that's what that integral there in the, in the paper, in the circled integral here is expressing. Now, we have to wonder how to do this calculation. So this, you know, we, what we're going to do is look on the, we're going to look on the left-hand side and try and use some bounds to express that as the right-hand side. I have a good idea where this is going to go. So let's, you know, when you, when you look at an integral like that, you ask yourself, you know, how on earth did you get the bound on the right hand side? You know, we're going to be a little bit sort of bold and try and do this without looking at the references because I predict that we'll waste more time downloading these papers, trying to find where that, that actual calculation is versus trust trying to do it ourselves. So let's just, you know, in order to decode this bound to try and have a go at proving it ourselves, and this is really a piece of good practice, you know, if you have a paper and you're working through a paper, it is extremely good practice to try and derive all the equations yourself. I mean, only then could you say that you really truly understood what was going on. And if there's like little pieces of magic left in the paper where you have no idea how you get from one equation to the other, then it sort of really challenges your ability to understand the paper. And these little... Mm, these little weak points in your understanding, they build on each other, right? And so it has this compounding effect that if you don't, if you're not quite comfortable with one equation and you're not quite comfortable with the next equation, then the logic gets shakier, you know, because a paper, you know, might, the logic in a paper might look something like this. You, you know, maybe we have some chains of implications um, and some statements, G implies B and blah, 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 until we come to the end result. And if you are sort of a bit shaky with one of these implications, you, you know, you can see that chains of implications are very important. You know, if here's the final result D and the final result D depends on all these implications behind it. And if, you know, if you can't quite work out each of these implications in one of these critical paths here, say A goes to B goes to C goes to D, then the probability that you really understand how to go from A to D is sort of decreasing exponentially, if you like. So your, your, your understanding of the paper drops really re remarkably ra rapidly if you don't understand each implication in a critical chain of implications in the paper. So that's just an aside, like this is just a, you know, a, my, a, my feelings on the importance of understanding implications of statements in papers. But let's have a look at the bounds. And the structure of the bound is something like an integral over unitaries. A one norm squared is less than something. So, uh, so here there's something in here, right? 
Now, one norms are a right pain, right? So L1 norms. So if you have a matrix, then the one norm of the matrix is variously, depending on which, which source you use, something like the trace of the absolute value of the matrix M, which is the trace of the square root of M dagger times by M. And that's just a horrible thing to compute, like because to compute the absolute value of a matrix, you have to work out its diag you have to diagonalize the matrix if it's diagonal. Uh, or in this case, you have to diagonalize m dagger m if it's not diagonal, if m is not di directly diagonal. And then you have to take use the functional calculus to take the square root, and then you sum up all the eigenvalues. So that's really extraordinarily painful. So we never ever really want to work with the one norm if we can somehow avoid it and try and work with another norm. And so the other norm that that really lends itself to calculations here is the two norm. Right? This is the so-called Hilbert Schmidt norm, and that one is a lot easier to work with. So the two norm squared is trace of m dagger m. That is much easier. Now, um, how do we relate the one norm to the two norm? Well, it turns out there's a convenient bound that tells us that you can upper bound the one norm by the two norm. And I'll bet you that's the bound that is being applied in this paper. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm totally off base on this and we're gonna spend the next 20 minutes learning that I don't know what I'm talking about. But, you know, uh, I'll bet you that's what's going on. So I know the structure of the bound is something like this, that the one norm squared is less than some dimension factor times by the two norm squared of some matrix. Now I can't remember the dimension factor. I know there's like a square root of the dimension there. Certainly it's not super good bound. I know that much. So there's various ways we can try and guess the dimension factor. So if, if M is an N by N matrix over the complex numbers, probably the worst case for this bound is when say all the eigenvalues of m are equal it's always one or the other right the, these bounds are always the worst cases for these bounds are usually when the eigenvalues of m are one and all the rest zeros or when they're equally distributed so let's just go ahead and guess just to try and guess this dimension factor that um worst case i'm, I'm going to go and google this in a second but because I can never remember these dimension factors. Is when eigenvalues of M are of the form, uh, let's just write them as a list. They're all equal and there's like N of them. I think that's the worst case for this bound. Then let's look at the left hand side of the bound. What's the one norm of a matrix squared? Well, that's just the sum of the absolute values of all these eigenvalues, all squared from J equals one to N. And what's, question mark, the right hand side? Well, that's the sum of lambda squared from J equals one to N. And so then we've got this big factor here that we're trying to work out. And if you work out this thing here, you get n squared lambda squared, but the absolute value, let's make these, let's make things sane and at least have these eigenvalues be real. So if you work out this sum here, you get n times by lambda, which you square, you get n squared lambda squared. And is this less than equal to some factor times by n lambda squared, right? That's what you get if you evaluate the two norm on the right-hand side. Well, yeah, sure, right? You know, what's the factor? The factor is n, the dimension. So my guess is, and it's been a little while since I've done this, that the one norm squared of a matrix is less than n, the dimension of the matrix, times by the two norm squared. I think that's correct. I seem to remember there being a square root of n in this story, but well, maybe that's when you take away this, when you take the square root of both sides. 
Um, oh no, I won't have internet connection here. So, I think that's correct. What I'll do is I'll go Google it. So the Hilbert-Schmidt norm here is otherwise known as the Frobenius norm. And this is the L1 norm or the matrix trace norm, depends. Um, and what we're interested in here is an inequality relating the two norms, the Frobenius norm and the trace norm. And I have indeed found it, and it is what I thought. Yeah, that's right. So the bound that is correct is this one here. So I just Googled it. And assuming we believe Wikipedia, that's the inequality that relates the one norm squared to the two norm squared. And that, I'll bet you is the inequality that we're going to use to evaluate this integral bound. So if we go back to this integral, excuse me, this integral that we want to calculate, and it's the integral of something squared is less than something. Well, the first step in this, in evaluating this integral, is that we're going to do, is we're going to apply this this trace inequality here, trace norm inequality here, and so that's equal, right? Um, sorry, less than equal, point wise less than equal. So therefore less than equal to the two norm squared times by this dimension factor n here. And the beauty of the right hand side here is that we will be able to evaluate this integral exactly. So the integral here the, the Frobenius norm or the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of a matrix is just the trace of this matrix dagger times by this matrix dagger. Now, of course, this matrix is depends, it depends on this VB in some way, and it turns out in not a very complicated way. Um, and that that's what we have to evaluate. We have to evaluate the integral of the trace of some matrix dagger times by some matrix, where in the matrix M, there's some dependence on this unitary VB that's chosen from Harmager. Well, it turns out, and this will be the subject of the next video, that we've already computed, I've already computed this, this kind of integral in a free, previous video a couple of video, uh, weeks ago, and I'll just simply apply that in the next uh, video uh, to give the bound that's advertised in the paper here. Indeed. I think that's the way their argument must work. And that will save us the trouble of reading those two papers. Although, of course, it's always good practice to read the other two papers. Okay, so well, on this suspenseful note, will, will this uh, strategy work or not? I would um, finish today. Thank you. Thanking you for your attention and looking forward to seeing you next time. Bye bye.